I wanted to sing all my life. It might sound an odd thing to say, but where I was brought up and the environment in which I was brought up was not conducive to having those sort of uh, ambitions for oneself. I come from a small market town called Dunfermline in Scotland, where people are very down to earth and do ordinary jobs and they go to teachers training college and they take up, if they're lucky, good middle class occupations and they live in a, in a house with their wives and families and they don't, uh, they don't become uh, big stars and go to London and make names for themselves. It's almost considered to be a sort of affectation if you say, I want to do that kind of thing. In, in Scotland, it's not considered very good manners to talk about what you want for yourself. Um, and consequently, one has to keep that kind of dream under wraps. I remember being interested in music from so early on, I can't tell you. But I'm told reliably by my mother that I used to sing in a high pram which in, in those days, in the sort of late 40s, I must have been very small to be in one of those sprung prams in the garden. They used to put me out there for a little sleep and the pram used to move and the little reedy voice used to sort of sail throughout the garden. So I was interested enough in music at a, as a tiny child to amuse myself musically and to sing. I used to mimic pop tunes of the day, just singing along to them. I think a lot of people who say they're tone deaf or they can't sing have been frightened or dropped on the head by some dragon at school and uh, they have no confidence musically. It's like when children under the, under the age of five, every child under the age of five can paint and draw and suddenly nobody can paint anymore or draw. It's the same with music. Everybody who's tiny can express themselves musically and all of a sudden at the age of about eight, nobody does it anymore. And I think it's confidence, and I never lost my confidence m musically. I think probably during my formative years, I would very much have liked to have been a classically trained singer, but nobody encouraged me to do that. There wasn't anybody who said, this girl's very good, we must see that she receives some sort of training. And I, I, I didn't know of any voice teachers. There didn't seem to be any. You could learn piano, violin, all that stuff, but you couldn't learn how, uh, how to sing. So consequently, I, ne I didn't ever go in that direction. And when I got to about 12, I, the, the early 60s pop music scene just sort of clobbered me over the head with uh, really, seems to me even now, wonderful influences like the Everly Brothers and then the Beatles. The Everly Brothers, in fact, are directly responsible in my history for, make, for giving me a love of folk music because they came from Kentucky where um, sort of uh, white gospel singing was done and a lot of traditional ballads were sung. And that's where I got my love of folk music. And from the Beatles, I got my love of harmony singing. I would rock my If I thought I could see If 
if I could see your face I don't want to hear your love songs I got on this airplane just to fly and I know there's life below me but all that you can show That story full of heartbreak and desire. And the last time I felt like this, I was in the wilderness and the canyon was on fire. And I stood on the mountain. If I could see your face things I do remember because my mother still has those records. She had quite a lot of Joan Hammond records and uh, Gili and people like that. A lot of singers. She's very fond of singing. So therefore I knew at an early age, I knew little bits about certain arias from Turandot or things like that. You know, I would know what they were without knowing why I liked them. But I did like them a lot. One aria which Barbara Dixon has always liked is Kay Faro from Gluck's opera Orfeo e Eurydice. The starting point for Barbara's own interpretation is Janet Baker's well-loved performance. I wouldn't do it like this, I would do it much more informally, I think, really. Couldn't do it like this. That's high. What am 
listening for is whether it's going to be possible to change this song from the way that Janet Baker sort of formally sings it to the, the kind of style that I have. It's really quite a tall order, I think. Um, yet it might not be. It might just be because I'm slightly in awe of this type of music. That could be the problem. And then I also want to find out if I can get up to those notes. So as I'm listening to it now, I would be listening, I will be listening for um, the pitching problems that I am likely to have and taking big breaths to kind of get up there and do the things that she does so effortlessly, which I have never been trained to do. She'd be able to do that, I think. That's difficult because of the long, there's long notes held over that and she's not taking a breath, the swine. I don't know what I'm going to do about that, but I think uh, that could be the most difficult bit of all. Yes. Lovely. Obviously, she has a formally trained voice and she has a kind of, um, she has, well, let's, let's just say it's like a, it's an operatic voice. Now, I know a lot of people are very fond of opera, but there are a lot of people throughout, well, certainly throughout the country who are very prejudiced against classical forms of singing. I am not one of those people, I have to tell you, because I grew up appreciating opera greatly because my mother loves classical singing and classical music. So I don't feel that it's stuffy or formal or elitist in some way. A, a lot of people do. Um, so I wouldn't like to sing, I wouldn't like to try and copy Janet Baker because for a start, that's not what people like me for as a singer. They like me because I sound completely different to Janet Baker and that I have a different style. And it seems to me if I'm going to actually enjoy singing this song and not worry about it every time I think, oh God, here comes Kay Farrow, um, I would be best to approach it in the way that I would approach any new song in my repertoire and that is to run it through, to uh, listen to it again, sung by her, to get phrasing help from the way she does it, but not to style, and then just to throw her cassette with respect away and to treat it now as if I was approaching a song like Another Suitcase or a song from Blood Brothers or one of the jazz songs that I sing, which are in their way just as difficult. <laughs> Barbara Dixon's first step in learning the aria was to go to her regular vocal coach, Ian Adam. Very, very nice. Now, okay. <laughs> yeah, fine, coming on. E yeah. Euridice, there's got to be a line. Eu Euridice. Euridice. Yeah. Just like Highland, Euridice. Euridice, yeah. The aligning thing is always a thing that even Italians find difficult there yes. on this aria. And try and not mow the words too much. Remember, they're a wonderful legato, they're very... Yes, yeah? yes. So when you say, when you begin that... Che faro senza 
Too much mouth yes, in it, you know, yes. so that you get a wonderful legato, a sort of yes. instrumental line. Yes. You're great at instrumental sense, there's no problem. Let's try it again. <laughs> okay. Not quite right. Can you just do it? Again? Okay. Barbara has to work on pronunciation, phrasing, and breathing, as she would with any new song. But K Faro presents particular challenges for the non operatic voice. We asked the distinguished soprano Sheila Armstrong to tell us about the aria. I think she's been very brave. She's chosen a very, very difficult aria for various reasons. Um, the story is that Orpheus is mourning the death of his wife, Eurydice, and she's been taken down to hell or Hades. But because of this great love that they have between them, Jupiter relents and sends Cupid to say to Orpheus he can bring her out of hell, but only on condition that he doesn't look at her while he's leading her out. She can't understand why he's so cold towards her and begs him to speak to her. Eventually he can't resist any longer and he turns and as soon as he looks at her she falls dead at his feet. Um, I think I should point out that Two things. This aria, though it's very tragic and sad, is sung in a major key, which is most unusual. Handel said he was despised from the Messiah in a major key, but normally sadness, you would, you would imagine a minor key to be used. So that's quite difficult. Um, it's also difficult because it's a trouser role, if you like. It's, it's, um, though it's a man, Orpheus, it is actually sung by a woman. And... Uh, and as for the technical difficulties, um, the lines, the phrases are very, very long. And so you really have to know how to breathe and how to support the breath and how to attack each phrase. And if you can't, if you don't understand those things, uh, then it's almost impossible to, to do it really well. <laughs> Not too much mouth. Support your rapids. I think that, like a lot of people in popular music, you tend not to, to sing uh, classical music or serious music at all. And if people do, um, oh, it's, it's always hideous. I mean, uh, people who love classical music, I think, are, have every right to criticise what pop music does to classical pieces when you get sort of Chopin pieces that have been, uh, had lyrics written to them and they're just so hideously schmaltzy and boring and they're sort of given the kind of the orchestral treatment to make them posh and I think that the, obviously the best thing to do I, I've always felt like this even when I was singing folk music is to un sort of unmystique it in a way get get rid of that rubbish of the finger in the ear and the men in the iron jumpers get rid of all that and look at the music for what it is as this should be looked at for what it is a beautiful tune and uh, as as valid as when it was written <laughs> Yes, it's the two syllables again. And remember, you've yeah. got the pa pa coming down yes. on the piano, so don't follow. Yes. Yeah, you know right. That anyway. Once again. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Three. Yeah. 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 No, no, don't do a step. That's a rock step. D C no D C. That's yes. a rock step, right, dearest. Right. Okay, so we try. Eurydice, yes. Yeah. One, two, three. No, no, you're still doing a step. D C. No. D oh, yes, it's not. There's no, 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 no extra no, no. note in it's there. It's so easy because that's what we do. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Eurydice. Di 
D นะฮะเธอพบปัญหาในการใช้คำว่ารีบเร่งเพราะมันเป็นเพียงเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังเพราะมันเป็นเพียงเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังเพราะมันเป็นเพียงเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเสียงที่ดังและเธอเริ่มต้นด้วยเส
One of the things that I did find most interesting uh, was listening to her sing The Scottish Lament. She obviously has an enormous gut feeling for this particular style. She's Scottish after all. She sings it wonderfully. And that style is absolutely right. Now a classical singer trying to sing that style would find it almost impossible. Um, but she does things absolutely naturally. She covers problems naturally in this Scottish lament that she finds terribly difficult simply because she's aware of the difficulties in the Kefaro. She sings through the consonants, no more, and it's, that's absolutely wonderful. And therefore, because she's sung through the consonants, she's getting this wonderful, rich sound. Um, so if she could just learn what she's doing, she could apply these things, I'm, I'm sure, uh, without too much difficulty. In McCrimmon's Lament, there's, you know, when you listen to bagpipes, there is a sort of, it, it, it doesn't have any light and shade. It's very much one, you can't play bagpipes quietly, is what I'm trying to say. The volume is there. So when you hold notes in McCrimmon's Lament, you, you tend to think bagpipes. So you're thinking of copying sound, not technique. It's nothing to do with being a singer. It's like um, copying a musical instrument to, to make your point. And the scale of it, uh, it lends itself to that. In McCrimmon's Lament, let's, let's think of a bit. You know, you drop a note like that, as you would on a chanter. The night is sailing. You'd also not pitch it too high, so you get a sort of um, breathy quality into it. So you can get a, a, a windy feeling in it as well, which, which suggests Western Highlands, if you like. Now, this isn't copying anybody. This is what I think as being the right way to sing McCrimmon's Lament. The breeze on the break is mournfully morning. The brook in the hollow is plaintively mourning. But my
time comes round to pay the bill And I'm afraid what can't be paid must be returned You never ever learn that nothing's yours on easy terms Only for a time I must not learn to call in my familiar eyes that face those eyes make future plans that cannot be confirmed on borrowed time gone before will be concealed your friends will never learn that once we were on easy terms living on the never never constant as the changing weather never sure I think that the way I feel about what I sing is much the same as a, a, a cellist who loves the music he's playing. It's not as simple as, as, as just having a wonderful, uh, wonderfully made cello and a great technique. We're back to square one, if you like. What I'm saying to you is that, in my opinion, that it, technique and the instrument are, are very important. But the way you feel about what you're playing on, on that instrument, I mean, if you take the best cello in the world, get the best cellist to play chopsticks, it's going to still be chopsticks. Whereas if he actually plays something that he loves and cares about on that cello, people will cry. In another departure from her usual repertoire, Barbara Dixon turned to the seven popular songs by the Spanish composer Manuel de Falla. The lullaby is beautiful because although it is a lullaby um, and gentle and, and very melodic, it has qualities in it that are not apparent in, in a song like, um, you know, like a cradle song, a European, northern European song from this country or from Germany or somewhere. And it has a really southern feel. And it has a, a sort of a, a thing in it which lends itself to the singing more sort of open-throated, which I never, ever do in my singing. I always considered it to be a rather coarse sound on a bit sort of hinge and bracket, and uh, <clears throat> it sounds sort of a bit mannered. But in a Spanish song, it seems to work somehow. The last line is where you really hear what I'm saying. It goes, da 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 It's very loud, really, and in comparison to what you'd do with a British song, you would go, la da 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 sing it very quietly, not wishing to wake the baby. But in this song, you can sing it out, and it doesn't sound like as if you're shaking the baby by the shoulders or trying to wake it up. And it sounds rather Spanish, which I think it's probably an Islamic influence, uh, Arabic influence in their music.
One of the things I think is so inaccessible with classical music, um, certainly with opera, uh, for the average person, is that it just sounds stuffy and boring. And if you had somebody um, who had a, a natural voice singing, uh, the, a couple singing the lead in La Boheme or something, and uh, with those wonderful tunes, I mean, maybe they couldn't sing it. It might be too high or too difficult or something, but somebody who didn't sound like as if they were a trained singer, but sounded like an actor, like they'd been cast in a Bertolt Brecht thing or something, a real person, warts and all, maybe people would like opera more. There's an unreality about the characters in opera because they all sing in this rather refined, um, slightly distant, ethereal way, which has nothing to do with the people they are supposed to be. I think in the end, the most important thing of all is that you should be aware not of what you're capable of, but of your limitations. That's very, very important. And uh, I think classical singers, there's no reason why classical singers should not sing some modern things. I mean, I include Gershwin or Kurt Weill in my recital programs, which people love. So I see no reason why Barbara should not do likewise and include the Defia songs in some of her concerts. But you have to know uh, where the limitations of, of your own style. And uh, if you don't do that, I mean, you, you can make a most dreadful fool of yourself, which I've done on many occasions. But also, a classical singer must be very careful within her own area what she sings. There are many singers who... Um, sing things which are too big for them. I mean, for instance, you might be a Mozart singer and they're trying to sing Wagner, and some very, very fine singers have come to grief uh, by simply doing the wrong things, things that they're not really comfortable and good at. Um, so it's not just a swap from one area of music to another, it's also within your own area. You have to have a lot of common sense and protect yourself, I think. Having completed a concert tour, and three months after her first visit to Ian Adam, Barbara returns for further work on KFRO. I'll join it onto the yeah, yeah. D. No, no, that's perfect. Right. Shall we, shall we try it again? Uh, just, just before we begin that, you, I mean, you know exactly what the words mean, yes. don't you? Which has to do with how you read each, you know. I mean, you know, after all, she's just died at your feet and yeah. you're about to commit suicide. It's all very dramatic. And so, uh, you say, you know, I've been your faithful servant right. and you're going to treat me this way. And you've got a great passion mm -hmm. when you sing. So the line of your voice will carry that beautifully if yes. you actually just stay yeah. in that factor. What I'm doing, of course, is just sort of still sort yeah, of but trying to it. get it right. Well, I mean, expression is not something I've been concentrating on, but I will bear it in mind. Yes, I'll yes. try and be a bit more All right. animated this time. But I wouldn't want to sing any classical piece of music which was so difficult that I wouldn't be able to think about who I was trying to be. And that's maybe why I would gravitate in classical music to the tragic person who's just about to stick the snake down her bosom, because I think, oh, that's rather nice. You know, it's very, that's a very meaty role. I don't think I'd want to sing the, a, a sort of rather jolly lady in an opera. I'd want to be the one who was coughing up blood on the sofa. The assumption that any lovely voice can sing any classical music is a dangerous one um, because it takes years of training, of 
practice of experience dealing with nerves. Uh, it takes a long time before you can do this kind of difficult aria really with ease and um, conviction. Going up yeah. to the sense, uh, when you get up on that ben on the top note, yes. where you say, ben! try and bring through your focus so yes. you then get, and then the great sort of passionate thing at the end, but not yes. dropping out, where it, you say, yeah. sense in me, you're going forward, ben. Yes. Doing a classical piece doesn't worry me, but I always think, why am I doing this? And that is the, it's the motivation that I think is the, is the most important thing. Why, why would I sing a song like a Gluck song? Would I want to do it to be clever? If I was doing it to be clever, I would hate myself. If I was doing it because I liked it, that would be perfectly acceptable. And I do like the song. And maybe I can't or don't sing it like other people would sing it. But it's sung from a very sincere standpoint, and I think that has to be given uh, credence. You get into the end too soon, but, I mean, you know, senza, yeah? Senza il mio bel Senza il mio bel Right, right. Yeah, shall we try, okay? Oh,